Thank you, and uh, welcome. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, so my name is Mehul Motani, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about artificial intelligence. Uh, so what is AI, uh, how it all got started, some applications, and some limits, and so on. And hopefully along the way, we'll uh, have lots of fun. OK, um, so what is AI? So AI is basically about pushing machines towards human intelligence. So uh, here's a picture of, for example, this robot. Is, it's called Buddy, the emotional robot, and he exhibits emotions, right? So this is something that um, you know, we all do as humans, and so it's interesting to ask the question, can um, machines do, uh, do the same thing, right? So, um, right? so uh, again, so AI is about um, making machines that can do uh, things that humans can do. So what can we do? We can think like people, act like people, think rationally, and act rationally. Okay, so this is the, the main goal of all of AI. And if you look at um, popular culture, there are many, many examples of this. So uh, I put together some examples of what I call AI in sci-fi. So I'm sure you, you can recognize um, many of these, right? On the left, we have some of the um, robots from Star Wars. In the middle, Terminator. Um, can you recognize who the person in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the middle is? Yeah, this is the agent from the Matrix, right? Um, uh, on the right, I think everybody can rec recognize Wally. -E, and then one of my heroes is um, uh, he's a robot or an android called Data from uh, Star Trek. So um, the, the presence of AI is there in, you know, in popular culture. And as I'm going to argue, it's there in our daily lives as well, right? So when you look around you, you might, um, at least in Singapore and in some other countries, you, you actually might be seeing self-driving cars, right? This is an example of um, a self-driving car from a company called Waymo. So Waymo is what started off as the Google Autonomous Driving Project. It became Waymo in 2009. Okay, so self-driving cars um, are going to be there. Automated highways, this is part of our future. Um, this is an example that I found. Uh, this is an example of an automated robot that patrols the hospital. And it brings equipment, medicine, whatever is needed from, you know, um, from um, different parts of, of the hospital to, to where it's needed. Um, autonomous drones, I mean, this is something that, you know, that all of us have probably played around with, um, meaning that we control a drone. But what about autonomous drones? So a drone that maybe can, uh, you order something online, and instead of um, you know, having the post office or a delivery service bring it to you, an autonomous drone brings it to you, right? Um, OK, so we see that AI is embedded, uh, you know, is, is there in all parts of our, our daily life. Let's do a short history of AI, OK? So kind of, you know, to remember, um, I guess, the roots, right? To see where we've come from and to understand how the development happened. All right, so uh, I'm going to start off um, with um, uh, um, Alan Turing. So I think um, maybe many of you have um, you know, heard of Alan Turing, maybe the Turing machine, the Turing test. So Alan Turing was a pioneer of uh, computational uh, science, um, uh, computer science and theory. And some people also think of him, him as a founder of artificial intelligence. So I bring him up because he came up with a very interesting idea. Okay, this idea that can a machine fool a human into thinking that it's a human. So you have a human giving a test, right? And the, it could be that, that human, the, the person giving the test, could be talking to either a computer, right, to a machine and an algorithm, or to another human. And the question is, can the machine be so good that it can fool the test giver into thinking that it's a human, right? So this was for a long time, this was actually the standard for, um, you know, what is AI? Like, can, uh, uh, can a machine think? In fact, uh, there's, a, there's an idea of this called a reverse Turing test, which is there probably when you surf the web. For example, when you, give a, uh, when you do a captcha, right? If you go to a website, and you have to, for example, do something on this website, that's a computer administering a test trying to determine if you're a human, right? So I think of it as sort of a reverse uh, Turing test. 
All right, so Turing is one. The, the other thing I want to show you is this video here, which shows what happened in the 1960s. Okay, so let's listen to these gentlemen. Hello, With me tonight is Professor Jerome B. Wiesner, director of the Research Laboratory of Electronics at MIT. Dr. Wiesner, what really worries me today is what's going to happen to us if machines can think. And what interests me specifically is, can they? Well, that's a very hard question to answer. If you'd asked me that question just a few years ago, I'd have said it was very far-fetched. And today, I just have to admit, I don't really know. I suspect if you come back in four or five years, I'll say, sure, they really do think. Well, if you're confused, Doctor, how do you think I feel? We're just really beginning to understand the capabilities of the computers. I've got some film to illustrate this point, which I think will amaze you. That man isn't playing checkers against the computer, is he? Sure, and it plays pretty well. Now, which color While you most computer like scientists that? saw it as a Where mere number cruncher, a small group thought that the digital computer had a much grander destiny. Being a general purpose machine, it could be programmed to do things which in humans require intelligence, play games like checkers and chess, and solve brain teasers. Let's see what it's turning out. The field became known as artificial intelligence. Can machines really think? Even the scientists argue that one. I'm convinced that machines can and will think. I don't mean that machines will behave like men. I don't think for a very long time we're going to have a difficult problem distinguishing a man from a robot. And I don't think my daughter will ever marry a computer. But I think the computers will be doing the things that men do when we say they're thinking. I'm convinced that machines can and will think in our lifetime. I confidently expect that within a matter of 10 or 15 years, something will emerge from the laboratories which is not too far from the robot of science fiction fame. They hadn't reckoned with ambiguity when they set out to use computers to translate languages. A $500,000 supercalculator, most versatile electronic brain known, translates Russian into English. Instead of mathematical wizardry, a sentence in Russian is to be fed in... One of the first non-numerical applications of computers, it was hyped as the solution to the Cold War obsession of keeping tabs on what the Russians were doing. Claims were made that the computer would replace most human translators. At present, of course, you're just in the experimental stage. When you go in for full-scale production, what will the capacity be? We should be able to do about, with a modern commercial computer, uh, about one to two million words an hour. And this will be quite an adequate speed to cope with the whole output of the Soviet Union in just a few hours computer time a week. When do you hope to be able to achieve the speed? If our experiments go well, then perhaps within uh, five years or so. And finally, Mr. McDaniel, does this mean the end of human translators? I'd say yes for uh, translators of scientific and technical material, but as regards poetry and novels, no, I don't think we'll ever replace the translators of that type of material. Mr. McDaniel, thank you very much. So, yeah, so I hope you enjoyed that short film talking a little bit about history. I love um, watching that. It's, it's really good to know what has happened before you if you're going to build and develop the future, right? So let's do a, a quick history uh, of AI. So, you know, um, even though AI is sort of hot right now, you know, AI, machine learning, deep learning, um, actually it started a, a long time ago. It started actually in 1943 with McCullough and Pitts who... Um, wanted to build an artificial neuron. So they built a model of a neuron in the brain, but an artificial one. And this, you could argue, was the beginning of, um, of neural networks, machine learning, deep learning, um, that branch of AI, okay? Uh, so in, in the 40s, people were very excited by that. They started to, you know, to, to take this artificial neuron, um, build computational machines out of it uh, from the 50s, and the 60s, there was lots of excitement, tons and tons of, of development. Okay, then we get to the 70s and 80s. And in the 70s and 80s, um, things start to become a little bit more systematic. So what I call knowledge-based based approaches. All right. Uh, also, in 1986, there was a very important paper published uh, in Nature by Rumohart, Hinton, and Williams. And this was the paper that um, presented... Uh, the algorithm called backpropagation, which is what we use to train the deep networks that are 
so popular these days. Okay, so we got up to the 70s and 80s. Let's get to the 90s. In the 90s, there was sort of, you could think of it as a resurgence, right? So in the 70s and 80s, like people thought we'd done everything that could be done. Then in the 90s, there was a resurgence. People started to bring in ideas from statistics, right? And um, uh, also, we started to see the, the, the emergence of um, uh, multi-agent systems and learning systems. Okay, then we sort of get to more closer to modern day. Uh, 2012, um, we had uh, something happened that wasn't there before. So, so prior to this, pr uh, uh, prior to the 2000s, we had the algorithms. What we didn't have was AI, uh, sorry, sorry, the data and technology. So that happened from 20, from the, uh, you know, from the, from, from the early 2000s onwards, the convergence of data and technology led to um, sort of a huge advancement in what we're able to do. So big data, massive computing, we start to see AI not just be in academia and in, 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 in specialized use cases, but it starts to penetrate our daily lives. And also things like neural networks and deep learning. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, this idea of GANs, Generative Adversarial Networks, and GPT-3. Um, what's the future? To me, uh, the future is clear. We're all working towards something called artificial general intelligence, which is the ability to solve any problem. Not just solve maybe a specific problem that I'm training the machine to do, but to solve problems that the machine has not seen, which is what you can do, right? So that's why we call it artificial general intelligence. All right, so let's move on. Um, we saw a little bit about how AI exists in our daily lives. We saw a little bit about the history. Let's do a little test, okay? So I want you to think, okay, what can AI do currently? Let's see. Do you think that an AI can beat a human grandmaster at chess? Probably, right? I mean, you've probably heard about it, right? Um, uh, Deep Blue and all this stuff. So, yes, we can beat a human grandmaster at chess. How about uh, beat the best Go player in, in the world, which I think at some point was uh, Lee Sodo, right, from South Korea? Yeah, so we already know that uh, a computer algorithm beat Lee Sodo, right? Uh, in fact, I think uh, he's not playing uh, professionally anymore. Um, can it, okay so, okay, so we can play chess, go, checkers, right? Can it unload a dishwasher? Because pretty much anybody can unload a dishwasher, right? I can bring you to my house and you can unload my dishwasher. Can, it, can a machine do that? It, it turns out that's a very hard problem. Right now, the answer is no. What about drive? Okay, I told you about self-driving cars. So can an uh, AI algorithm take a self-driving car and drive safely along the highway. Actually, it turns out that is. If you look at, if you go to, um, if you go online and look for videos of, of self-driving cars, you can actually find self-driving cars that, you know, kind of go on the highway and so on. What about, um, so we can drive on highway. What about driving along like city streets, like New York City streets? Turns out that's a little bit harder if you want to do without running somebody over. So right now, we are not there yet. We're close, maybe, P people argue. Lots of people are trying to do it, but we are not there yet. What about buy a week's worth of groceries on the web? I mean, you can go to you know, online grocery supermarkets and buy stuff, right? So it's not surprising that a computer can do that. But you can also go to the market and buy. Can a, can, can a computer do that? Actually, I'm not sure it can, okay? What about discover and prove a new mathematical theorem? Well, I don't know. We're trying. What about perform surgery? Well, we're not sure yet. So we see that, 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 you know, that AI can do a lot, but there's stuff that it cannot do, right? But technology, again, is still evolving, so let's see what happens. All right, so let's talk a little bit about, um, a little bit about, about applications. We've already seen some broad applications, and we know that in our daily lives, uh, I'm trying to argue that AI is there, so, um, uh, here, uh, here is a, a graphic that shows uh, some of the verticals in which uh, AI plays a tremendous role. So, for example, smartphones. Your, your, your smartphone is, is using a lot of artificial intelligent algorithms. Uh, security and, and surveillance feeds are being monitored, for example, to look for, you know, in airports, looking for suspicious packages, suspicious behavior. Social media, right? Facebook, Twitter, all are using AI to present to you, for example, your feed. They want to give you what is important and interesting to you. 
um, navigation, Google Maps, Apple Maps, right? Obviously, there's intelligence being used there to try to find you the best route home. E-commerce, when you go to um, Taobao or Lazada or Amazon, there, you know, on the back end, there's intelligent algorithms trying to figure out what you, you're going to do and present to you the best products so that you're going to, of course, buy from them. Uh, banking and, and finance, the obvious application there is search for fraud. Can I detect? You know, if, for example, you deviate from your buying behavior, but is someone else you, using your credit card or is it you just buying yourself a birthday gift? Uh, of course, self-driving cars use it to vision their environment and make sure that they drive safely. And um, these days, I'm seeing the emergence of smart homes, right? Homes that um, cater to, to, uh, to your every need in terms of lighting, music, right? anything you want. You wake up and your coffee is already made, made, uh, is made for you. Okay, so, so, so we see AI in our everyday life. So let me take a little bit of a twist on this. Okay, I'm gonna say a little bit about AI in the new normal. What do I mean by, the new, uh, uh, by this new normal? Well, we're all living life during the, the pandemic, right? So I thought it would be interesting to see what has AI done for us during the pandemic? So this, these pictures here kind of, this, this woman on the right is exactly how I felt for a long time. I felt behind bars, right? And everybody's f f figuring out how to wear masks and, you know, um, wash their hands and like in the US, for example, don't know that happened in, in Singapore, but there was a run on toilet paper. So people are starting to grab stuff, right? But let's see um, some applications of AI during, you know, this, what I call the new normal. So for example, um, if, if you uh, were strolling in Bishan Park recently, in Bishan Ang Mokyo Park, you might've seen this sort of yellow mobile robot. Okay, this is actually, um, I think it's called Spot. Uh, it's a robot from Boston Dynamics, and what Spot was doing was it was walking around ensuring that people were socially distancing, right? So it has to figure out this is a human, not a tree, and these two humans are too close. So this is a great use of AI. Um, another interesting use is in the healthcare domain. Um, this is one of my colleagues was actually using um, AI to try to look for the best combination of drug treatment. So for example, um, what are the most effective combinations of drugs that are treatment, you know, good treatments against, for example, uh, COVID-19, right? But the, the, the applications of this technology are boundless, you know, tuberculosis, COVID-19, liver transplants, and so on. So I thought this was a an, an, an really interesting use of AI to try to make people's lives better. Um, remote teleconferencing. I think we're all in some sort of fatigue, Zoom fatigue or you know, Google Meet fatigue. But actually, if you look carefully, there's a lot of AI happening in the background. Uh, recently, I think both Zoom and Google Meet and some of the other um, services have started to implement AI-powered transcripts, right? So that means they, when you're speaking, they will know exactly what's um, uh, being said and also who said it. Remember, in a meeting, multiple people are talking. So if you want to actually have a record of the meeting, it's not just knowing that someone is talking, but it's knowing who is talking. Right, and also on the, on the bottom here, I have some animations of uh, dynamic avatars. So I thought this was kind of, a, a, a kind of cool. Uh, there's this, I read this interesting story of um, uh, uh, a reporter at Wired, where what he did was he built an AI and he wrote um, some responses and he participated in two weeks of meetings as an AI. He wasn't him, <laughs> it was his AI and he fooled all of his, um, his coworkers. All right, um, okay, uh, personalized learning. So one of the things, so, you know, I work at NUS, so education learning is very important to me. And so one of the things that AI has been used to do is to personalize learning, right? So it basically, um, you figure out what do students know, what are they having difficulty with, and then what should they be working on to help them with what they're having uh, difficulty with in an automated way. And you do it in a customized, personalized way. So for example, I might be having trouble I don't know, with fractions, and you might be having trouble with expon uh, exponentiation, right? And so on. So can we figure that out, and can we give you the right uh, tools and knowledge to learn better? Okay, so you've probably figured out that, wow, there's a lot of applications of AI, and especially AI in the new normal. But actually, I, I wanna flip it around again. And I wanna say that, actually, maybe AI 
is the new normal, right? Like we've had such an advancement of technology that, um, that I believe that AI is going to be the new normal, okay? So for example, uh, let's go through a few examples of um, where I think uh, the most exciting developments in AI are happening and why those developments are gonna change how we live our daily lives, how we interact with the world around us and with other people. So one is uh, what I call social robotics. Okay, in social robotics, the idea is you have these mobile robots that will interact with you. So for example, on the lower right is um, a little animated GIF of a bank teller. This is something that HSBC is actually trialing around the world. Uh, I haven't seen it in Singapore, but um, I read that, 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 that they're doing trials in the US, uh, certain cities like New York City, some cities in Europe, and so on. And the idea is that you walk in and, and, and this mobile robot comes and talks to you and it interacts with you and it figures out what you want and it helps you achieve what you want. Uh, this is actually, um, all this technology is based on a robot called Pepper. Is Pepper the, the robot? Uh, and I remember I ran into Pepper uh, a couple of years ago in uh, Shenzhen. So when we could actually travel, I was in, in, in Shenzhen, I was in a mall and I actually ran into this mobile robot and you know, there were, of course, everybody was crowding around it and, and, and so on, but you could see that if you need, actually needed help, like you want to say, oh, I want to buy sneakers or something, the robot would be able to direct you and help you. And maybe first, and, and I didn't get a chance to try this, but maybe even figure out what you need, okay? So I thought that was very interesting. So I think that interacting with, uh, so not just interacting with machines, but with machines that can truly understand you and, uh, um, and help you achieve what you want to achieve. All right, another thing that's really um, close to and important to me is personalized medicine, right? And so this is the, the idea that um, can we use AI to deliver uh, better um, medical care? So better patient outcomes, lower cost, better hospital um, efficiency, and so on. And so I alluded this to a little bit when I talked to you about uh, Identify, which was about drug combinations. Right, using AI to find better drug combinations, right? Um, though, um, so what, what we wanna do here, and, and this is something that I'm actively working on, what we wanna do is we wanna generalize that and see, can we actually personalize medicine to, uh, you know, to a single person level? So rather than um, uh, do what's done now, which is you can think of it as population-based medicine, so you look at what has a general effect on the population, right? So for example, you probably heard, um, I don't know if this is true, but if you, for example, uh, have hypertension, you should eat a low, low, low salt diet. This is sort of what I mean by a population-based recommendation. It's a one size fits all type of medicine, right? Now, the, the path to personal, personalized medicine moves towards first, uh, maybe stratifying patients. So instead of a population, you have smaller subpopulations, but this is still, population-based in the sense that it's subpopulation-based. What, what we're really after is the subpopulation is, is of size one, so single person. So we think of you as a you know, single person with you know, a set of activities, body functions, and so on. And the question is, uh, genetics even, the question is can we customize um, medicine, drug combinations, treatment at the single person level? And you know, it turns out that you can do that. We are working on that, and you know, AI um, is a big part of that. Uh, and I, I think may, maybe we're talking, you know, 10, 15 years in the future. But I, I fully believe that something like this is going to be happening because we can do better at the single person level. All right. Um, the third example I want to give you that's uh, kind of phenomenal, uh, mind blowing, if you don't mind me saying, is uh, in the field of natural language processing. Okay, uh, in June of last year, OpenAI, uh, which is a, um, an institute that, 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 that does intense research in artificial in, uh, in, uh, intelligence. So OpenAI released uh, a language model called GPT-3. Okay, now you see three. So there was GPT-1, GPT-2, now we have GPT-3. All right, and this is the most advanced language model known to date. Um, I, I don't have the exact figure, but it was pretty much trained on the whole internet. We're talking about 60 million websites and all of their hyperlinks. 
Okay, so this natural language model is trained on that. Um, so what OpenAI has done is they've made this language model available to everybody, right? And what you can do is you, you take their model, which has, let's say, been trained on the internet to achieve a set of tasks, and what you do, you take this pre-trained model, right? So I believe this is the future, this paradigm I'm talking about. You take a pre-trained model that's been trained on, you know, billions of um, pieces of data, and then you retrain it, you fine tune it to do the task you want, right? So let's say I want to build a task, uh, I want to do a task, I want to build a question answering task in, um, in engineering, right? It's not clear, GPT-3 has not been trained to do that. GPT-3 has been trained to just learn, you know, to have a very strong language model, but I can fine tune it to build a question answer model for engineering, okay? So let me give you a few examples. As I said, pretty much mind-blowing, okay, what GPT-3 can do. Um, all right. So GPT-3 understands what you mean. So for example, uh, let's read this. It says, generate uh, front-facing young black adult female with brown eyes and long hair. So there. So, the, okay, so of course, this is not live. This is an animated GIF. But this was done live. This is done using GPT-3, right? Here's uh, another one. It says, generate a white male with short brown hair and blue eyes, OK? And so this is very interesting. The algorithm understands what you mean. And you can interact with it in a natural way, as opposed to, you know, right now, the way we would interact with it is there would be a framework, a structured system, and you'd have to check off boxes, and yeah, it might be able to do, do something similar. But this says you can talk to GPT-3, you can talk to the algorithm as you would talk to another human, right? I might ask my grad students to, to go do something. I can ask GPT-3 to do the same thing, right? So this, I'm just giving you a few examples, but the powers of, of GPT-3 right now seem unbounded to me. Okay, so GPT-3 can chat, so this is, um, someone built a chatbot. This is a WhatsApp chatbot, right? The, but it's GPT-3 on the back end. It's not a human being. And so look, you can actually interact with it. How can I make a hamburger taste like a Michelin star meal? You should, I mean, the, all the responses are given by the algorithm. And yeah, again, this is just a short animated GIF, but there are many examples of, 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 of chatbots. But this one is, you know, it's, it's not like the bank chatbot that will help you do banking. It's, you know, you can't go tell a bank chatbot, I'm sad, right? You can tell GPT-3, I'm sad. It will know what to do, all right? Um, so that was the second example. Um, the, the, okay, so, so that was good stuff. But actually, there's a dark side. <laughs> GPT-3 can fool you. So there was this, um, you know, when GPT-3 was released and OpenAI made the um, interface, the API uh, available, people started to use it. And this college kid, he decided to write a blog using GPT-3 and see if he could fool the world, and he did. He actually, so if you know anything, if you know about, about Hacker News, it's a, it's a, it's a very well-respected sort of top um, you know, technical um, website, and this guy's post made it to the top of Hacker News. And um, I didn't do this, but I read that when the original post was put up, there was only like one or two people who said, is this a bot? The rest of the people thought this was a human being writing it. Okay, so GPT-3 can fool you. And uh, we gotta, I mean, you know, this, okay, so this is just one example. I'm gonna show you later that actually the, the problem is a lot worse, okay, in the sense that there are mu many more things. So you combine GPT-3 with what I'm about, about to show you, which is called the GAN, a Generative Adversarial Network, okay? Um, uh, again, is uh, a computing algorithm that can learn to generate an endless supply of samples from a very small sample. So for example, I give it um, maybe 100 human faces, okay? 100 human faces, maybe 500, let's say, a small amount. What it can do, it can take that and it can generate an unlimited, unbounded um, a sample of human faces. And I'm gonna show you a few examples, and, and they look very realistic, okay? 
Um, the idea behind a generative adversarial network is to, to take two deep learning neural networks and pit them against each other. The way I think about it is, think about, um, so a good example is think about the police and think about a counterfeiter. The police want to figure out if bills are counterfeit or not. The counterfeiter wants to make print money that can fool the police, right? So these are the two networks. They battle with each other, and in the process, the police get better at finding co uh, counterfeit bills, but what does the counterfeiter do? He gets better at generating a uh, counterfeit, and that's the samples that I told you about, the fake stuff, right? So let me show you an uh, example. This was done by some guys uh, in, in, in the, uh, uh, some researchers from uh, Samsung. They took the Mona Lisa, right? Uh, they took several views of the Mona Lisa, and they're able to animate it. It's kind of cool, right? The Mona Lisa can talk to you. This is done, as I said, this is not, this is not a human, there's no human behind this. It's done completely generated from this static picture of the Mona Lisa and a GAN type of algorithm. So I call it GANs bring the Mona Lisa to life. Okay, uh, and, uh, something else. Um, so can you tell which of these faces are fake? <laughs> yeah. I hope all of you are laughing. Um, so this is actually a website, whichfaceisreal.com. So what do you think? So, so I, I actually did this. I was, I was playing around, and, and I found these two really, really interesting uh, examples. So on the top, there's the red-haired lady and the, on the right and the lady on the left. One of these is real and one of these is fake. Can, can you guess? How about the bottom? I mean, I can't in, in, interact with you, but what, what do you think? <laughs> anyway, it, it, it turns out that in both these cases, the image on the right is real. The image on the left is fake. So it's pretty good, right? Think about those two images look very real. So anyway, this is done by GAN. So this is what I meant. If you combine, combine GPT-3, GPT which is a natural language model, with GANs, I mean, all bets are off. You really cannot believe anything you see. And um, I forgot to mention, I don't have an example of this, but this is just images. Um, GANs can do video as well. So fake news, fake me media, right? You really can't, I cannot believe. Okay, so we saw that, we see that um, AI is all powerful, right? It can do good and bad. But actually, is AI all powerful? I remember I was on a plane once and somebody asked me, the person I was sitting um, next to asked me if AI is like all powerful, like something like that. And I thought about it, and I realized that the answer is no. AI can be fooled. Okay, so here's an example. So this is a, a stop sign. It's an octagon. Now, I could show this stop sign to my four-year-old son, right? Uh, sorry, he's going to kill me. He's eight years old now. But I remember I did this when he was four. All right, I actually showed him this stop sign and said, is this a stop sign? And he said, yes. And I think, I think none of you would be fooled uh, into thinking this is not a stop sign. But yet... What, what some researchers did was, if you look at the stop sign on the left, you see they put some stickers. You see it says, love, stop hate. So this is a very popular way of, uh, you know, uh, amending, right, just to send a message. But it turns out this is done very, very um, intentionally and, and, and in a particular way, such that it fools um, a deep learning AI um, algorithm into thinking that this is a speed limit sign. Okay, this was a, a CVPR paper in, in 2018, okay? Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't need to be this. You can even have just, look at the image in the middle. The image in the middle is just four stickers. And again, that fools an AI. It's not going to fool any of you. So in some sense, AI is awesome. But in some sense, it's very far from general human intelligence. Uh, that example on the right is kind of amazing because there's no stickers. It's just shadows. And the shadows fool the AI algorithm into thinking that this is not a stop sign. Okay, so that was one example. Here's another example that's uh, kind of amazing too. This is, um, a, again, this is an adversarial example where these researchers 3D printed a turtle. So this is, uh, yeah, so they 3D printed a turtle and the original turtle model that, that, like, that they bought or, or whatever looks like a turtle, you see? So it's, but the 3D printed turtle model, the the adversarial model 
gets recognized as a rifle. And this was intentional. They wanted that to happen. And they're able to get state-of-the-art AI algorithms to say that it's a rifle. So again, these, th there's a huge set of research in adversarial attacks to, to fool these AI algorithms. And since, for example, it's possible to do that, right? there are obviously limits to artificial intelligence. And so I, so I gave you a couple of examples. Let me try to wrap up by saying some of the challenges facing AI. Right? So the, the main challenge facing AI is artificial general intelligence, right? Yeah, right? So can AI solve any problem, right? So what I mean by that, again, is, for example, I could train a language model to be a chatbot or to, to do question answer. But, I mean, you growing up, you're not trained or taught to answer questions. You're just, you just grow up, you learn language, and you can do any language task. So that's the question. Can we have an algorithm that you give some knowledge to but can it learn to solve problems that it was not trained to do, right? Can AI think? So, so, so another way of phrasing that question is, can AI think and operate in an unseen environment? Okay? Um, now, that's, as I said, that, that's a broad problem, right? Uh, there's some sort of sub-issues um, that I want to raise. Uh, one has to do with emotional intelligence. So can an AI have EQ? So EQ is emotional intelligence. Or IQ is the intelligence quotient, EQ is the emotional quotient, right? And we, we are starting to learn that, 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 that to be successful in life, you need, need to have a balance of IQ and, and EQ. So that's the question, can an AI have EQ? And, 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 and the question there is, can an AI intentionally tell a joke? Right, that's why, I, I don't know if any of you caught that, but the picture on the right is again, the robot data from Star Trek. And if you're a Star Trek fan, you know that one of the things that Data always struggled with, right? And so this means that the creators of Star Trek were very aware of this, was telling jokes and laughing, right? He could learn about laughter, he could read jokes, but he couldn't tell a he, he could laugh, but he couldn't tell a funny joke, right? Okay, cause and effect. The, I think the other big gap for general intelligence is cause and effect. Can an AI reason about cause and effect? Right? You do this, this happens. So let's say in one scenario, you do A, B happens. You go to a different a scenario, and instead of doing A, you do A prime. Well, does A prime cause something like B to happen? We do that all the time, right? You, for example, you touch a, like, if you touch a stove in my home, you'll get burned. If you go touch a stove in your home, you'll get burned. You can figure out cause and effect. AI. Right now, this is a big gap, right? So can an AI transfer causal relationships uh, between domains, right? So this is, I think, one of the things that as we move towards artificial general intelligence, we'll have to solve. The last one, again, is saying the same thing, but maybe it's worth um, you know, um, discussing it explicitly, human behavior. Can an AI truly behave like a human? For example, we care for other humans. Can an AI care for another? Whether it's a human or an AI, right? So that's, that's interesting. Can an AI care for another AI? Of course, we can ask, can an AI care for a human? But I thought AI to AI was an interesting question. And can an, I mean, we all ponder the, 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 the meaning of life. Can an AI ponder the, the, the meaning of life? So these are the questions I think that we have to uh, answer if we're going to get over some of the limitations of, uh, of the current state of AI. Okay, I'm going to end by uh, a quote by uh, Mahatma Gandhi. It says, the future depends on what we do in the present. So it really is up to you, right? Where we go um, forward is really up to us, me, you, all, you know, all of you watching, uh, and so on. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to end. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, we start with the first question. Is AI, such as self-driving cars, really necessary? We have billions of people who need a job. Is AI another race to space where people are racing each other, but not really helping humankind? For example, poor, homeless, jobless. This is an excellent question. Um, I see that there's basically, um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna break this up into two, into two sub-questions. So are self-driving cars really necessary? Well, no, right, because we've survived for many 
years without it. But if you want to get to a point where you have things like automated highways, right? If you want to take, if you want to eliminate traffic, you're going to have to take traffic and driving away from humans. The reason is um, humans are, are irrational, right? And AI is not irrational. And, and, and maybe that's the problem. That's why it cannot have general intelligence. But I think if you want to move towards efficient traffic and transportation systems, we'll have to have things like self-driving cars. But I agree with the a person who asked the question, we don't need self-driving cars. But I think it's gonna happen, okay? Because, well, we wanna move towards efficiency, right? And, you know, in a, a Singapore with, with this limited land space, I think efficiency is very important. Your, your second question has to do with um, helping humankind, and I think that's a great question. And a lot of people are asking this question. There are a lot of efforts um, in, the, in the broad umbrella called AI for good, right? So what you're talking about, poor, homelessness, and jobless, yeah. So there are things are happening. There may be not, you know, you don't find New York Times articles about them, but there are lots of um, people looking at this. So uh, yeah, like, like for example, the stuff that I do, trying to do a better medicine is arguably in that space, um, okay? So don't, you know, don't feel bad, there are people, so AI is not just something to help an elite few, the idea is really to help the masses. Okay, number two, how to differentiate robot and AI? Is AI more an intellectual capability and robot more a mechanical ability? So yeah, that's a very insightful question. Um, so you're right, a robot has many, many components, right? There's a mechanical subsystem, there's an electrical subsystem, there are sensors, right? So anytime that you want to sense something and then actuate, you have to process what you sense and that's where the AI comes in. So, right, so this robot is, um, let's say, looking at the environment, right? It, 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 there's, a, there's a bunch of vision feeds, uh, camera feeds. The question is what do you do with those camera feeds? That's what AI does. And then when, when you want to actuate, make a decision on what to do, AI has a role there too. So for example, the, there's a field of AI called reinforcement learning in which an intelligent agent interacts with its environment, okay? And in interacting with its environment, it takes actions based on the feedback from the environment. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Robot and AI are two different things. AI is an integral part of, of robotics. Um, okay, are there any other questions? Will the unemployment rate rise because of the wide press uh, use of AI. Uh, this is um, a big concern of many people, right? Uh, will automation, uh, digitalization, will AI lead to un unemployment? Um, so this is my opinion, okay? I cannot predict the future, but this is what I think is gonna happen. I think that um, jobs are gonna change. Certain jobs will be redundant. But I think there are going to be new jobs that, that pop up, right? You could argue the, the same thing hold, holds true for things like clean energy. Of course, the coal workers are going to be out of a job, but there's going to be new jobs in clean, in clean energy. I think the same thing holds true here, okay? The same thing holds true here, that, that we're going to see different jobs. P people are going to have to adapt, right? Uh, but that was a great question, thanks. Uh, okay, question four, bicentennial man, IQ, EQ, and AI. I think so, I, I, but remember, Bicentennial Man was a movie. So um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. They're trying to incorporate all aspects of that. I'm not sure I understood your question, but yeah, I think you're right, that, 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 that when you see AI in popular culture and so on, they are trying to incorporate all aspects of this, right? Okay, number five. I understand it is massive effort to train an AI, even for a simple chatbot. Wonder if it is worth the effort to pursue. Where's the balance? So you're asking, like, you're asking the wrong person because I think I'm, I'm doing it, right? I think it is possible it, that, sorry, that it is worth the effort. And the reason I think it's worth the effort is because AI allows you to do things that you could not do before. So I'm not a fan of technology for the use of technology, which is what I think you're asking, in, in, you know, the person who is, who's asking question five. You're absolutely right. We don't use technology or AI just for the sake of it. It's, it's only valuable if it allows you to do something you could not do before. And AI is allowing that. So for example, there are examples of people who wear 
the smartwatches, and the smartwatches have actually caught that this person has a certain disease. And they would have never thought of that. They would have never, ha never have thought of going to the doctor and saying, do I have this disease? But because they had a smartwatch that was measuring some vital signs and so on, the you know, algorithms in the back end were able to figure out you know, that this person had a certain disease and they could get treated. So things that were not possible before are possible now, which is why I think it's worth the effort. I hope I convinced you. Are there any other questions? Okay, uh, six. Should AI be used to drive sustainability first since they demand immense power and, and material? Okay, again, this is a great question. You're absolutely right. The AI requires a lot of power. You know, I recently read that to train these deep learning models like you know, GPT-3, GPT which is trained on 60 million websites, you're absolutely right. It uses a ton of power, right? There's, 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 there's like you know, uh, racks and racks of GPUs that are consuming power. In, in fact, some of these companies are putting their data centers in like places like the north, you know, in the north where it's very cold to get natural cooling, right? Because it's so hot. And of course, the cooling of these machines takes energy, right? So you're absolutely right. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there are people who are, who are looking at sustainability, uh, both from a viewpoint of can the AI pay for itself? So, so the two aspects of sustainability are can the AI pay for itself? I think the answer there is yes. And also, uh, can AI do good? Right? So I said AI for good. And I think, as, as I mentioned to the other, other person who asked the question, there's a huge um, effort in doing, doing, doing AI for good. But I think all these questions are great. We do have to find a balance. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It was uh, my pleasure to talk to you.